Thank you, and uh, I'll begin by observing that uh, this panel is uh, not as exciting as the previous and other panels on climate science. I was uh, once in my life a practicing scientist, and then I was forced to become a practicing engineer because there were no jobs for scientists at that time, and all my engineering friends said I got a promotion, and my science friends said I got a demotion. So I've been in the schizophrenic world my whole life. And then I got involved in policy, and you know both my science and engineering friends said to me when I, when I got into policy. I want to start and just paint a very broad picture for you about what I think are the uh, science realities related to energy. And the science realities in the energy domains are actually easier than the climate domains. The laws are clearer, uh, the experimentation is easier, and the engineering is in fact a lot easier. We're not doing geoscale engineering, we're not trying to change the planet. And I'll begin with just sort of a set of rules and they'll have some obvious conclusions, but I'll tell you what the conclusions are. And the first order rule is that uh, the world is going to get wealthier, uh, and it's getting bigger, and wealthier world consumes more energy, not less energy. It doesn't matter what forecast you look at from any organization other than you know, fringe people who are best, I, I don't know what words to use, other than you know, <laughs> whack jobs who think we should have ZP, negative population growth and go back to nature, but that's not happening anywhere on the planet. There's no evidence that's happening. You have more energy going to be consumed in the future because of more wealth. And I'll begin with the first and the most common mythology that is in play when it comes to climate issues, because remember, at the core, all climate uh, policies that, that are ultimately affected are always about energy. There's, no, there's nothing else about climate policy other than giving money to climate scientists to genuflect to the idea that the climate apocalypse is happening. Other than that, policy effect of spending billions on climate research on scientists other than those that are in this room, of course. Other than that, the principal effect is to, effect, is to impact energy policy. That's all it's about, because in the end, that's essentially all of what the debate is about. What can we do to fuel the world's civilizations? How do you change that? And can it be changed? And the most common myth on both sides of the political aisle is that the well, first thing we have to all do is make the world more efficient, more energy efficient. And I'll just tell you a very simple economics principle for those who remember studying economics 101. Efficiency is a synonym for lowering cost. So improving efficiency lowers the cost. Lowering the cost is what permits this curve. Lowering the cost of energy, making it more efficient, making cars more efficient, making planes more efficient, making refrigerators and air conditioners more efficient, making manufacturing more efficient, allows the GDP growth to outgrow the energy growth of the world. It doesn't push energy consumption down, it pushes wealth effect up. And that's been true for a millennia, it's gonna be true for a long time. The second um, sort of high level, high order reality and by the way, the reason I'm showing you these realities is because the relevance to this is what will, in fact, I think, happen with regard to the world's energy systems, what policymakers can do, other than take money from party A and give them to party B. What I'm talking about is what they can do with respect to the fundamentals of how the world is fueled. This is uh, looking back in time and going forward in time and all the forecasts from the, from the IEA and EIA and the retrospective of where the world gets its energy into three buckets, hydrocarbons, which is coal, oil, and gas, all the renewables bundled together, and nuclear. And what you see is sort of an obvious picture. The world gets most of its energy from hydrocarbons in the past and will in the future. The point of this illustration is really twofold. In energy systems at the global scale, to deliver energy at the scales the world needs and will need we're talking about, to use physics terms, very high inertia. We're talking very high inertia in physical terms because of the scale of the systems. We're talking about very high inertia in economic terms. Even were it the case that replacements for hydrocarbons were fabulously better than they are today, you have a very high inertia system. It'll take a very long time to move trillions of dollars of annual capital investment in physical hardware the oil and gas industry alone spends $6 trillion a year on CapEx building physical things to extract and deliver and refine oil and gas. $6 trillion a year. The cumulative physical infrastructure in dollar terms is in hundreds of trillions of dollars. You don't change systems like that overnight. You don't change them in years. In fact, you don't change them in decades. So it doesn't matter what you do at the bottom of that curve, doesn't matter how many incentives you push into renewables, you can't change the inertia of the system. It's simplistically, you know the analogy everybody uses. It's like trying to steer a super tanker faster by pushing harder on it. You, you can steer it a little faster, 
but it'll still collide with a little sailing ship that's in the way. Uh, it'll just collide with it uh, one foot further along the bow than it did by pushing harder, but it'll still collide. These realities are immutable. And I'll give you a sense of sort of the kind of trope that I run into all the time. People say, well, we're going to make batteries more efficient. We're going to make solar power more efficient. We're going to make it cheaper. All true. All true. But there's running against some very fundamental challenges in the physics of the energy systems evolve. I'll give you two examples of uh, sort of that uh, calibrate the science and engineering of the physics of energy that talk about hydrocarbons versus alternative energy. If we were to improve the thermodynamic efficiency of power plants that burn hydrocarbons in the United States by three percentage points, three percentage points, and I assure you if you talk to material scientists about what it takes, that requires raising the temperature of combustion by 25 degrees C. That's actually, in, you know, not a lot, but in material terms, it takes some work in the steel and, and, the, and the welding and joints to do that. It's not trivial, but it's certainly achievable. Three percentage points increase in the combustion efficiency of America's power plants would add uh, 80 gigawatts to the output of the power plants that exist today. The total installed capacity of solar photovoltaics in the United States is 20 gigawatts. So you, if you think about where innovation can go to make a difference to supply energy, the, the arithmetic here is sort of immutable. Another one that's very popular, and that's, I've written about this, and I, I got maybe the most hate mail for titling the column this way, uh, Tesla derangement syndrome. <laughs> I thought it was a good title. Uh, and I started by praising the Tesla, because it's a, it's, I think it's a very sexy car. It's marvelously engineered. Uh, and uh, other, other automakers are, are copying it. Uh, the new BMW and Mercedes uh, plug-in hybrids are emulating some of the architecture. They're, you know, it's great. Uh, but there, here's a fact point that you should have in mind, because the Tesla derangement syndrome works down on the little uh, curves at the bottom, and we're trying to replace the hydrocarbon curve at the top with magic new batteries. Uh, so the measure that matters for airplanes and cars is how far you can go per pound of fuel. That's all that matters in the end if you're an engineer. And we know that batteries, by the way, it's as easy to figure out, you can go about a half a mile on a pound of battery. It's about how far you can go in a Tesla or any or whatever electric car, Prius if you prefer. You go half a mile per pound of fuel. And the battery is a consumable fuel. It lasts you know, a few years and then you have to replace it, maybe five years or ten, but it's consumable. Uh, you go half a mile per pound. If you take an average uh, fuel efficiency car today, you go six miles per pound of fuel. So, but we're going to make batteries more efficient. We're going to make them twice as efficient. We're going to get them to one mile per pound of fuel. You could, this, by the way, the National Academy of Sciences issued a study that uh, pointed out there is no electrochemistry visible or known that can double the efficiency of batteries that exist today. So it doesn't exist. There's no, there's no path to doubling. But assume you double, you get, to a, uh, you get one Mile, one mile per pound of fuel, you can double the efficiency of an internal combustion engine by spending a little more on the engine by increasing its temperature of operation, uh, and you can go to 12 miles per pound of fuel. That's why airplanes fly on jet fuel, not on batteries. <laughs> and, 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 and will forever, by the way until there's new physics. And as a physicist, I'll, I will pledge to you there will be new physics, because if anyone you know, says the phys physics is over, I mean, I was originally going to be an astrophysicist, like Willie Soon, who I admire, uh, and I discovered there were no jobs for astrophysicists, so I became an engineer in semiconductors, where there were, there were actually jobs. And, uh, but I was doing surface physics. It was, you know, you, you make, you know, a, a microprocessor surface is hotter than the surface of the, of the sun, so it seemed like I was moving in the you know, right kind of discipline. Now, this, this uh, graph is uh, illustrating uh, a very specific phenomenology in engineering over the last 10 years. So I'm going to segue into oil, because oil is the iconic um, political energy source. Even though in, in, in the industrialized world, uh, the growth in electric demand is the single most important metric that determines the health of an economy, the reliability, and the and the price of electricity are utterly central. In fact, 60% of the non-transportation use of energy is in electricity. Our demand for electricity in our mature economy in America has increased 50% in the last three decades, despite all the phenomenal improvements in efficiencies in lights and motors and, and, and air conditioners. But electricity is, is what really matters to fuel the digital economy. So I'll give you a, a before I talk about shale, I'll give you a, a factoid that will, will help you that annoyed my friends in the green community the most of probably any single thing I've written or studied in my life. Your, your iPhone or your iPad or your smartphone, if you look at, and I have a free study online I released again a couple years ago on this called The Cloud uh, Begins with Coal, 
<laughs> it's obviously a provocative title. If you, um, if you watch a Major League Baseball game or a movie on an iPad and it's streaming you know, on, your, on your device, uh, that uses more uh, energy uh, for the hour you're doing that than driving to the game in a Prius 30 miles away. <laughs> Not in this device. This could use zero. It's in the networks that deliver this. That's where all the energy is consumed, in the telecommunications networks, in the fact of the data centers themselves. So I, I calculated that your, your typical teenager's iPhone utilization, YouTubing and tweeting and Snapchatting, they don't Facebook anymore. Old people Facebook, kids don't. <laughs> you know this, right? This is true. Uh, but all the rest of the social networks are lit up and they like video and you can do Dick Tracy talking. This is two refrigerators worth of electric demand used that way. When I released that study, Apple sent around a press release to all the press. This, this study went viral globally, got calls from Russia and France. It was kind of exciting. Apple issued a press release saying that when you to recharge your iPhone, you plug it in at night, it doesn't use more electricity than a nightlife in your ch a nightlight in a child's bedroom, which is true. This could use zero electricity, could be totally charged with hamsters, you know, a little treadmill <laughs> each night, and it would still consume, the way you probably use it, one refrigerator worth of electricity a year. We sell 400 million of these a year. We'll soon sell a billion of them a year and the demand is, not, is going up uh, geometrically because people only have one refrigerator, but all of you, if you're like me, have four or five of these kinds of things in a house. iPads, iPhones, kids have them. To oil, though, the, the iconic fuel is oil. What happened in the oil market is sort of bizarre. We were going to run out of oil. Peak oil was coming. Since you're running out of oil, the iconic fuel, if you're running out of it anyway, and it's getting more expensive, why not accelerate that to get off of this evil hydrocarbon and get rid of the evil oil companies? If it's going to go away anyhow, why not subsidize a more rapid transition? The inconvenient problem is that it didn't go away. We now have a world glut of oil. Oil is, is oversupply. That's why the price collapsed. It's oversupply because the United States entered the new era of shale oil. It is a phenomenologically and structural different way to get oil. In fact, you're effectively manufacturing oil, liquid hydrocarbons, from source rock. If you talk to geophysicists who are actually scientists, uh, you will learn the oil and gas originates in the source rock, which is shale. The physical resource of source rock is measured in thousands of billions of barrels of oil. Not millions or billions, but thousands of billions of barrels of oil. The only way, the reason we haven't been able to extract it to date is we didn't have the technology. Horizontal drilling, which is an information-centric technology with micro-seismic imaging and hydraulic fracturing, unlocked shale. This graph is very interesting about what the technology has done. Take a look at the rig count, which is in the news all the time, that's collapsed, right? It's down 50%, therefore the shale revolution is going to end, and the Saudis have killed the frackers in America. And look at the red line, which is the production of, of oil in America. By the way, we're now the largest oil producer on the planet, and the fastest growing producer of oil on the planet, and oil production grew, I know, it's amazing, isn't it? Grew faster last year than any time in history because of thousands of entrepreneurs in America, like the old days, using new technologies. This is not an artifice of discovering a new oil field, it is a result of technology progress. But you'll notice that the production in oil and shale rig count sort of tracked, right, they sort of lags and started tracking, then the shale rig count went flat. For the last five years, and oil production just took off. That's a common technological phenomenon of actually figuring out how a new technology works, and it suddenly starts to get more efficient, you get better at it, and production has been taking off. What's going to happen now is the whole shale fields are going to do what you would call in the oil business high grade, all going to chase the more efficient technologies. What the Saudis are going to discover is by driving prices down, they'll have accelerated, not decelerated, the pursuit of the most efficient technologies and the most efficient producers. And the U.S. capability to produce shale oil will double, and our average cost to find it will go in half, which means that the United States will now have Saudi Arabia level capabilities in production, Saudi level resource capability, and very close to Saudi Arabia level of lower cost of acquisition. This last thing I want to show you is the um, change in the economic efficacy of the technologies of oil, shale, versus the three most commonly discussed uh, alternative energy sources. This is a EIA data of the average uh, energy you get per dollar span of capital equipment from a shale rig, how much has changed in the last five years. It's gone up 500%. You get 500% more energy per dollar spent in the shale fields because of technology progress in the last five years. Compare that to how much lithium batteries have improved. A lot, right? 
about 200 plus percent in solar and wind. All are improving, but technology is uh, kind of a funny thing. It's agnostic. It gets better everywhere, which is what the renewable advocates forget. The interesting thing that they don't seem to have noticed is it gets better much faster in the shale fields than it does anywhere else. In fact, if you track patent applications, there are more patents filed and issued in hydrocarbons by a factor of 10 than there are in all of the alternative energy fields combined, which should tell you something about where the intellectual uh, energies are going, not to uh, use a pun. So last, I'll leave you with this one sort of macro thought on the energy domain, which I think has relevance to the, uh, the climate debate in economic terms. We thought there was peak oil, and if this is the U.S. oil production, not global, and of course, if you draw from 1946 to date, you found that the U.S. production of oil on oil fields did peak and start declining. There are a lot of reasons for that, but largely it's because we were using the technologies of the late 19th and early 20th century. Along comes shale technologies, and look what the curve has done. It is inconceivable to me, after an investment of $800 billion in private capex in U.S. shale infrastructure, that that evaporates overnight. What will happen instead is it will do precisely the same thing as happened with the tech bubble of the late 1990s. Massive capital investments going into new technologies that no one really knew how to optimize. Huge bubble in stock valuations, but the underlying assets didn't go away. When the stock valuations collapse, which also collapse because of overcapacity in the internet and data centers, the high value players came in and vacuumed up the assets, took the best technology and created Internet 2.0. That's why my new paper is titled Shale 2.0. We're on the verge of Shale 2.0, which will high grade and optimize all that's been learned over the last 10 years of a very new industry in the shale fields. And it will optimize not just based on the engineering, but also interesting on the big data and big data analytics. We've, built, we've drilled two billion horizontal well feet, just the horizontal part, in the United States in the last seven years. To give you, you, you know, you, you should tell us no, your arithmetic. This is going around the earth about 28 times of horizontal steel pipe drilled. The data set that's been accumulated from that is measured in the hundreds of petabytes. This is equal to the global data set in healthcare. It has not begun to be data mined. When you data mine that and double the efficiency there, sort of Uberize the shale fields, the shale revolution goes into 2 0, and the Saudis have a big problem. And so do the green, uh, the yeah. green guys, by the way. Gotta, gotta Thank you. Off there, man.